the Trade, Tourism, Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee. Um, today is November 19th, and I'm Councilwoman Janice Hahn, and I am chairing this committee, and I'm joined by Councilmember Bill Rosendahl. Why don't we take item one? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> item one, the general manager of the Convention Center Department excuse me, <clears throat> department is here to make a presentation on um, recent achievements, current operations, and future activities at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I see you have a giant award. Yes, and I suppose you'd like to ask, for us to ask you what it is. What is that award yes. that you have? Um, Starting about 18 months ago, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Puriya Abbas, the Chief Executive Officer of the Los Angeles Convention Center. I'm joined by Philip Hill, the Chief Operating Officer of the Convention Center. Um, starting about 18 months ago, uh, the Convention Center team uh, started a very challenging and ambitious path to obtain LEED certification for existing buildings. As a matter of uh, reference, there are about 100 buildings in the nation that are LEED certified for existing buildings. It's extremely difficult to certify a, a existing building with LEED standards. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Efficiency and Environmental Design. Uh, the Convention Center is composed of a 1971 building and a 1993 building. That's why it was very challenging. Um, as I said, about 100 uh, buildings are LEED EV certified for about 6.1 million square feet. So after 18 months, on October 16th of this year, the U.S. Green Building Council awarded the Los Angeles Convention Center with LEED certification. Uh, again, as a matter of comparison, uh, Convention Center is 4.2 million square feet. So prior to that, there was only 6.2 million square feet that was LEED certified, and again, Correct. Convention Center at, at 4.2. It was, it's quite a tall order and quite a proud moment, I think, uh, for the city as a whole. It's a, we are the first city of Los Angeles building to also get this award. You've heard of the libraries and the police stations and the fire stations being LEED certified, but those are all new buildings. And again, it's extremely difficult to retrofit and do all that work for you older building and then for building our size again. And it's just a testament to the great work and uh, convictions and commitments of the Convention Center family. What did it cost you? This costs us, the LEED certification process costs us about $300,000, but what we've done starting a few years ago, we've started retrofitting and replacing equipment at the Convention Center, he uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning e equipment, chillers and lighting mm -hmm. systems and so on. And that work has uh, probably had an investment of about $3 million. The beauty of that is we took loans from the uh, Department of Water and Power to do much of that work, and the loans were paid back from energy Very efficiency. Nice. So zero net cost Excellent. to the Convention Center. Excellent. So, it, it, And again, it is an innovation that uh, I think other uh, city family organizations are going to be using. Very good. That's a very large award. I was wondering what the carbon footprint of that actual monument is. <laughs> yes, thank you for asking that question. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the, the award itself, uh, actually the base of it is also a testament to the carpenters group of our uh, hmm. convention center. This was actually the base for one of the tables that were used for the Grammys last year. So we took that and Reuse, made the base recycle. of it. Recycle. Very good. So, uh, we also wow. have a, um, a little um, representation of our appreciation to the committee because you've been extremely supportive of us. It's just um, identifies the day that we became LEED certified. And again, I really want to appreciate the committee. Uh, over the last 18 months, I've been before you and spoke about the things we want to do. And thank you for not looking at me and thinking I'm crazy and you know, being extremely supportive of this effort. So uh, I wanted to bring that uh, to your attention. Additionally, um, there do, are Can I ask a question? Yes, uh, one of the things I, I thought was interesting about the um, uh, the Democratic National Convention in Denver was that um, delegations coming to the convention from all across the country were asked in their own way to reduce their carbon footprint and actually each state that was able to achieve that got a special green symbol on their, yes. their signpost. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was an interesting thing going beyond just the actual building 
but actually the people that come for conventions. Is there any kind of an outreach to the actual convention goers uh, that you reach out to them before they come and, and talk about how they might mitigate or reduce their carbon footprint uh, in their travels to Los Angeles? One of the things we've done, we've partnered with two groups. One are the decorators and the contractors that actually put up the exhibits at the convention center and ask them to implement measures through which they can add value to our environmental stewardship program. And we have those on our website and it's accessible and so on. Uh, additionally, show management, basically, uh, the uh, individuals or firms that put on the shows have been contacted and we've shared with them what our programs are and what, are, what it is that they can do. So in their manual, and brochures that they send to their uh, clients. They talk about recycling efforts uh, uh, and you know water conservation efforts at the convention center. Uh, actually, that's a great idea for us to take that a bit further. Talk about carbon footprint and yeah. so on. So and maybe even look in terms of incentives, one sure. way or another, for um, conventions uh, where they have you know been able to mitigate or reduce their carbon footprint sure. to in actually coming here and participating in the convention. Might be one step I'd say it's further. a great idea. I look forward to coming back to you in our next update and providing you with some information as Good. to what we've done there. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, yeah. Madam Chair, there's a couple of other items yeah. I just wanted to uh, bring up to your attention. Um, as you know, the economic uh, situations in the nations are going to have their impact uh, on the convention center both from a convention uh, business standpoint and also from the regional events that we host at the convention center. However, um, I'm very, very confident that we're going to continue operating the convention center in the black. We've implemented measures to cut down operating costs at the convention center, and we're going to continue doing that with minimum impact on service levels. Again, we are a service organization, so there's limitations to what we can and right. cannot do. Uh, but uh, again, we've had two strong quarters, so, uh, but the, the, sec the third and fourth quarter of this fiscal year are going to be extremely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. That's why we've implemented measures in, uh, you know, to be able to mitigate against the negative impacts that will come our way. Mm -hmm. um, are you finding canceling? We haven't seen, uh, Councilman, we haven't seen that many cancellations, but the events that are coming are definitely contracting in terms of uh, the size of their expenditures. Uh -huh. So, you know, less food services or right. less electrical, or we, we definitely see that. We see it in our parking, uh, which, you know, we, you know, we get revenues also, not just for convention center mm -hmm. attendees, event attendees, but also Staples Center and LA Live and all that, mm -hmm. and we see a drop in terms of have we had any in, uh, change in bookings since uh, Nokia Hall has opened? Uh, Nokia, and we have the Convention and Visitors Bureau here with us. Uh, Nokia has had the most uh, positive impact on us, where we actually have hosted few events here at the Convention Center where they have used the space at the Convention Center and had their general session at Nokia. <laughs> and had maybe a food function in Nokia Plaza. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great uh, additional asset to us, a tool to market the conventions mm -hmm. and bring in clients. We are speaking to some clients, uh, uh, you know, currently that may use convention center and we're looking for additional space and we'll be able to mm -hmm. provide them with space. So are you offering deals? I mean, they, everybody, that's what everybody says now. Everybody's offering everybody's deals. Offering everybody deals. is hurting, so. Certainly. You know, every, everyone's negotiating everything these yes, days. we are. Are you we, are too? We are. We're looking at packaging services, and we are going to do something very different from what we've done before. And I'm going to come before council and request your approval, and I would appreciate the support of the committee. Uh, we are going to move away from a set standard rental rates for uh, for our space to something that the hotels and the airline industry do, having demand-based flexible rates. Currently, to, to, rate exhibits, to rent exhibit space at the convention center, you have to pay 32 cents per square feet, no matter if you're in the great months of October and November mm -hmm. or in the worst month of December, you still 32 cents. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no doubt in my mind that if you're able to, uh, to offer incentives for people to book in December, for example, uh, reducing our rent to 28 cents uh, or, or whatever makes sense. And also looking at maybe in, when we have 
few events competing for the same time frame mm -hmm. uh, to increase our rates at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to add to our financial base mm -hmm. significantly. So we are coming before council to request a set of flex, uh, some flexibility. Mm -hmm. So we will have a standard set of 32 cents and then be able to ramp it up or down based on demand. So mm -hmm. those are the things that we're looking at doing. So. Good. I mean, I think the, the times call for that kind of creative flexibility. Well, we, we, we have to play the game like everybody else is right now. Um, and you were going to give a, a labor update? Labor. Actually, I'm very happy to report that the economic issues on their uh, question and on their consideration have all been addressed and resolved. Currently, there is a contract that both parties have agreed to before uh, the, nego the two negotiators and the mediator to be signed off. There is some national language in there that is beyond, as I uh, pointed out last time, is beyond our control. But even on that, they have reached agreement. So, so when will that be signed? Uh, they, uh, and historically, the contracts have been signed in December. So we are, we are keeping our finger cro fingers crossed that it would be signed. And everyone's December. agreed to it. Okay, good job. Question. Well, that was just going to be my whole story, was how we are on that. We had a room packed with people mm -hmm. uh, about, what, a month ago? It was about a month ago. So uh, everybody's on the same wavelength, yes. and we'll do a little holiday <laughs> celebration? Yes, as we should. If, if there isn't, if all of a sudden something breaks loose, we'll uh, let you. you'll let the Certainly. community know. Certainly. Okay, great. We are also doing something a little bit different this year uh, we haven't done in the past, um, especially in regards to the economic condition and what all the community is feeling, and, and I'm very cognizant of that as you are. Um, next week, I think we're going to be joined by the mayor and maybe you, Council Member uh, Han, and Council Member Perry, where we're going to be distributing uh, turkeys uh, to families in need at the convention center. And if you recall, in the past years, uh, we used to have a Salvation Army, uh, Salvation Army Thanksgiving dinner at the convention center. Uh, currently, we have an event in house, so we could not have that dinner, and we had a choice of canceling that dinner, basically. But we decided to move forward and have it done at the shelter. So we're going to be serving yeah. 1,200 hot meals right. to uh, families in need. Again what we can do to help the community. And I think it's Very just, good. we have to be a partner. Very good. Time, so. LA Auto Show. LA Auto Show. It's not all over the Today Show this morning. Yeah, it, uh, media days begin today. Mm -hmm. um, I have never heard so many different languages spoken at the convention center. One thing that is very interesting, and I was sharing with a few people here in the audience, is the number of German-speaking uh, you know, individuals at the convention center. What is happening is that definitely the uh, U.S. auto industry is obviously feeling uh, specific pressures, but there are other manufacturers that are ste stepping in, which is very interesting. So the performance of the media days today mm -hmm. and tomorrow is going to really dictate the um, overall auto industry trend in the coming year. If we have a great media uh, presence from international sources and local media, uh, shows there's still a lot of interest, and if not, then. Okay. True. Yeah, I was. They were uh, interviewing someone who said, you know, considering what may possibly happen with the with the automakers <coughs> industry, will there be some day when there'll never be an auto show? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, and the message was, there will always there be will some kind of an auto show. There's always an interest. I have to share with you though, Detroit is really feeling the pain. The Detroit Auto right. Show, which is uh, LA Auto Show is the number two auto show in the nation, and Detroit is the number one auto show in the nation. Well, it'll be interesting to see, you know, the 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 hybrids, the green cars that are and being. That's what you're that'll be the interest because, unfortunately, you know, our automakers haven't uh, made a car that has had <coughs> good, you know, emission stand better emission standards for like 30 years. Correct. So, you know, we have not produce the kind of cars that I think people want and demand and need, and we need to be driving. So shame on them. Let me ask you a couple quick things. Uh, we're in the budget process all the time these days, and we, we're having status reports and updates. We mm -hmm. just had one again yesterday. Uh, next time you meet with us, could you tell us what kind of a revenue stream you think you'll be projecting for the general treasury for us come our next budget strategy? I will, I'll put those numbers together. We'd love we'll to see second. what kind of figure you're talking about. Second thing, just a quick one. What ongoing savings do you project in the operation cost for the newly upgraded lead facility? We're going we're gonna to make some, save some money over this whole 
wonderful lead certification. Certainly, and the savings are going to be from our uh, energy uh, costs. Mm -hmm. That we see the real numbers, and that's how we've been able As to you pay said, out the loans. Uh, with the energy savings, you've paid for all right. the lead. So that that is exactly. Improvement. So uh, I would say the payment on those lo various loans might come up to about on a yearly basis. Uh, Three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we're paying that completely from the savings. Correct. So once those loans are all paid off, then the savings remain, which is the whole point. Great. Okay. Thank Here's you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. You're a, a leader and a model in this country. I appreciate. We're proud of you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is is Dennis Lyon planning on coming? Okay. Okay. Let's take item two. Oh wait. What did we? What were we doing on that one? This is a presentation. No action is necessary. Okay, item two. Under item two, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for <coughs> approval a short-term replacement lease with Avis Rent-A-Car System for operation of a car rental facility on premises totaling 24 acres located uh, at the airport on Airport Boulevard, um, I'm sorry, at Los Angeles International Airport. The proposed lease would expire on January 31, 2010 to coincide with the expiration of Avis's concession agreement for rental car operations on those same premises. By that time, the department will have conducted a new competitive process uh, for award of a new lease and new concession agreement. Uh, the CAO has submitted a report and a recommendation for approval of the short-term replacement lease. So this is basically a one-year? Basically. One-year uh, extension of their lease until we are, are Go out to going the, uh, out to the, the big consolidated rental facility. Is that right? Well, I don't know no. that the consolidated rental facility will be ready in a year, but um, it's to expand oh, it's their <laughs> lease to coincide with the concession lease for t till 2010. We will go out through a competitive I see. RFP so this process. is just kind of a bridge That's lease. Correct. Okay. Mark, did you have something to say on that? It didn't look like she was looking over her shoulder. Oh. Okay. Just so you know, I'm Vivian Howell from Los Hi. Angeles World Airport. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Vivian. So, um, and then how does, how, explain to me again how this fits into the, the next piece. Uh, the next piece being the CONRAC, is that what you're yeah. referencing? Yeah. Let me defer to Mark Adams okay. on the CONRAC. Um, from the Consolidated Rental Car Facility, that's... It already has an acronym, an CONRAC. A consolidated Rental wow. Car Facility, yeah. <laughs> the CONRAC. Um, Right now, we're going through an exercise with the architects that we um, and the and the various stakeholders, principally the car rental facility, uh, the car rental companies, to um, <coughs> figure out exactly what that facility is going to look like, and so um, that is not going to be done in the time frame. But what happens in a year? Uh, we'll be going out for competitive process for an RFP to put it out to any car rental place on a competitive process. For this, to be able piece, to, for this piece of land, correct. I see. That's correct. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, uh, I'm hoping that we do in future RFPs is an include um, incentives for green cars, hybrids. I really want to give, uh, make that a priority for, because I think when people come to Los Angeles, that ought to be something that is readily available if they would like. And we would encourage, I would think we would want to encourage people on our freeways to be driving um, low emission vehicles. So that would be something I would be very interested in seeing in the next RFP, so, some kind of incentive for rental facilities that have, and I don't know, you guys figure it out, a certain percentage of their cars um, to be uh, low emission vehicles. I think that's kind of how we ought to be thinking. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, good morning. Uh, Fentress, uh, great uh, day Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where do we think um, this CONRAC uh, is going to be located? Manchester Square, where? I mean, we've looked at well, different sites and we've talked about different ideas. Under the approved master plan, it's supposed to go on the site of what is now parking lot C and D. Um, there's a, one of the things we're doing with our um, architect consultants who's not Fentress. Fentress was working on the terminals. Yeah. It's AC Martin and uh -huh. um, who's working on the uh, <clears throat> on the Conrack. What they're looking at right now is um, the possibility of moving it over to Manchester Square. Manchester Square is a very large parcel. It's not under the uh, arriving aircraft path so there's more opportunities there. It's closer to the 405. There's some 
adv advantages. So what we're doing is sort of going through a, a, an exercise of analyzing the currently approved site versus the other potential site and seeing what provides a better opportunity. Yeah, I like that conversation because uh, it seems to be suggesting, and of course I'm not the king of the world in my mind on this issue, but I, I'm more instinctually inclined for Manchester Square because of its accessibility to 405 sure. and the whole issue. Plus, it allows other opportunities for, for what we were looking at, right. consolidated rental space. So uh, when can we get a report about some sensing of what makes the most sense and what kind of a timetable at that point? Um, we could do it right after the first of the year if you want, or, I mean, we yeah. don't have a lot more committee meetings this year, but we could look at right after the first of the year if I you'd like. I was wondering, Madam Chair, if we could do it after the first year, they could give us a real full-blown update mm -hmm. on where we are, how the uh, different uh, automobile uh, groups are, are, you know, the rental cars are thinking about it, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, the whole nature of everything on this one. Okay. Because there is a spot that we would like to make for a conference center. You know, that discussion, mm -hmm. that would mean uh, one of the car rentals getting out of there and the time frame. Mm -hmm. So all of that is kind of packaged together. Understood. Well, Great. yeah, so we'll, we'll bring back a presentation on the development of the CONRAC after the first of the year at, at the chair's discretion. Okay, yeah, good. Nice. So do you want to make a m motion to approve this replacement lease? So moved, Madam Chair. All right. Chair. Thank you. So Before you okay. run, Mark, just a... a, 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 a no, let's see if I want to make this move. No, we'll save it for another time. Thank you. My three holes of the golf course is what I want. <coughs> Do we have a sense on that? I believe the board approved an RFP for that yesterday. You're kidding. I don't believe that? that's on our. She's, she's coming. Really? She's coming up under the concessions. So that can be. Well, no. She, Deb, Debbie Bowers is here to report to on help report on the concessions item. That's number four on your agenda. You yeah. can ask her when she comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I am thrilled to hear that. Although I'm not really a golfer, doesn't that make your score go up to have three extra holes? <laughs> it makes a lot of people I'm in just, Westchester happy. I'm just saying. That I can do. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to do the math here. But Westchester Seems is thrilled. You have thrilled. a much lower score with only 15 holes. I thought that was the object of a good game. No, no, it's more time. Okay. Time. Let's take item three. <laughs> um, is, uh, this is our paparazzi item. Is Dennis, is uh, Council Member Zion coming? He was expected, and he's going to be here shortly. I heard he was going to be here at 9. Well, then. <laughs> um, <laughs> any minute? Okay. So well, one, well, no, because that's the concessions is a long one. So yeah. let's, let's go ahead and take this and tell okay. Denny he's up. Under item three, we have consideration of motion Rosendahl Zine Garcetti introduced on September 12th, proposing that the council ask Los Angeles World Airports, the airport police, and the city attorney to report to this committee with an analysis of current procedures to preserve public safety at LAX um, in the midst of high profile passengers and paparazzi and to include recommendations for increased coordination among those groups. Also that the council ask LAWA, the airport police and city attorney to submit this report to the Los Angeles Regional Paparazzi Task Force for consideration at its next meeting. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm James Butts, the Director of Public Safety at Los Angeles World Airports. This is George Santana, the Chief of the Airport Police. Good morning, Chief. And while we didn't have a written report, I thought I was making a verbal report. Now, right, that's what I heard, oh, but you're okay. making a verbal report. All right. Well, to give you a context, we have about 61, 62 million people a year fly in and out of. How many? 61, 62 million a year, supposed to be down to 55 million this year oh, uh, wow. out of LAX. And we estimate anecdotally probably 50 to 70 of those persons per day may be classified as celebrities of some type. And in that definition, meaning people that the media are interested in or have a fan following. Um, the reality is that we have about half a dozen paparazzi that station themselves in the vicinity of LAX, not on the property, um, that are on call. Like, where are they? At the In-N-Out? or I don't know where they are, but okay. they're, they're not on the CTA. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but they respond very quickly, and they okay. get their information um, from sources, either publicists within the celebrity community that want to right. have uh, mm -hmm. uh, the publicity, mm -hmm. or um, people that receive payments to, to give them information on the whereabouts of celebrities. Scanners. 
Okay. And and the reality is, is though, we have very few incidents that are paparazzi based. We've had um, two in 2008. And um, what would you uh, define as an incident? Uh, an incident requiring a police intervention. So we've had two in 2008, and in each instance, uh, the instigator was either a security person that was bodyguarding a celebrity, or in one case, it was alleged that the celebrity himself instigated a, 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 an attack against the property of a paparazzi. So uh, the reality is, is that as far as paparazzi and celebrities, mm -hmm. we don't have an issue with uh, paparazzis in general. The bigger issue for us is crowd control. Mm -hmm. When fans become aware mm -hmm. that an A-list celebrity is going to arrive or depart from LAX, and crowd control issues are best handled by redeployment of uniform personnel, which we do. Uh, we maintain, thanks to the council and uh, the airport management, a very vigorous airport police force. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we get information that there will be a celebrity and a crowd control issue, mm -hmm. then we will deploy preemptively to be in the vicinity. But as I said before, um, we estimate probably 50 to 70 celebrities of some type come to the airport each day and we really don't mm -hmm. have a problem. Mm -hmm. On the on the crowd control when there is a, is a big celebrity, what does that <clears throat> mean for the airport police? It depends, on the, it depends on the magnitude. For instance, um, when uh, Beckham came to the United States uh, to play for the Galaxy, that was a, a large uh, incident command type of setup where we had to uh, do significant planning to uh, accommodate uh, movement to the airport. And our focus is really not for the celebrity, it's to maintain um, the environment for our commercial passengers and to protect public safety. And that's our focus. And how are, how are you notified when <clears throat> there is a celebrity, a big celebrity? We are only notified if someone from the celebrity staff or the security personnel are concerned that there will be a crowd control issue and that's when we receive notification. And uh, very infrequently, our first notification is the fact that there are fans gathered to, um, they've gotten word some way, usually through a publicist, mm -hmm. that a fan is going to arrive, and we start to see the uh, collection of people, and we respond. And are you asked to protect the celebrity, or you're, uh, when, when you get a call like that, what's, what are you asked by their publicist? Actually, their the, the only notification is that they're expecting a large number of fans and they're concerned um, uh, for the safety and the ingress or egress of, of the celebrity, and they just want to let us know that mm -hmm. they will be coming through, but they don't ask for protection. Um, now, there were, in the paper today, it talked about when uh, a Britney Spears lookalike mm -hmm. uh, that was diverting, it was the decoy, and it talked about Britney being taken out a, a secret door. Or mm -hmm. Well, actually, actually, that was where is that? That was door? Jamie Lynn Spears. It was oh. a Britney sister. Okay. And um, she actually came off the airport operation area, area side. She never came through the terminal. Okay. And then there was an allegation that there was a, a decoy sent through to divert uh, the photographers and fans, and and we are investigating that allegation. It, but if you're asked, do you have another route out if they well, need that? Actually, uh, someone can be taken off the airport operations area mm -hmm. side, and the airlines themselves have that option at any given time to uh, take a passenger out that mm -hmm. way. Okay. So in your mind, uh, you don't s so far you don't see this as uh, being a huge problem? Well, 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 no, actually it's proven to be insignificant. The two incidents, like I said, we've had this year right. were actually instigated by security or allegedly the celebrity themselves. Right. And um, because we have such strict uh, traffic control guidelines at the airport, uh, you, you would be immediately taken into custody or detained if you blocked uh, either uh, mm -hmm. pedestrian or vehicular traffic. I think the bigger issue is uh, out on the public streets where um, traffic is interfered with on trying to photograph or, or slow down the movement of a celebrity in a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And what would you do in that instance? Well, I think, uh, not I think, there are laws, mm -hmm. uh, traffic laws, uh, mm -hmm. that deal with uh, mm -hmm. impeding traffic 
and there are traffic laws with um, constructively uh, impeding the movement or free movement mm -hmm. of people and, and mm -hmm. they can be enforced. Of course, I, I, uh, my concern too is, I mean, it's our terminals are public spaces. Yes. Uh, and if we were to uh, look at some way to restrict paparazzi or whatever, is there a way to tell the difference between you know, no. The daily breeze photographer and a absolutely not, and the, and, and the quote paparazzi. And, how, how would you distinguish? And in distinguish fact, how them? would you distinguish between anyone uh, that had a lawful right to conduct their business in public and take photographs, mm -hmm. and then to immediately discern that from someone that's just another passenger that sees uh, a celebrity and wants to take a picture? Right. Because the paparazzi, uh, in my experience, are always dressed casually. And they could look like uh, any traveler. Now, the 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 equipment that they yeah, have is very indicative yeah. that they're professionals. Right. But I, I still don't see how you could legally discern. Right. Okay, uh, Chief, did you want to add to this? No, discussion? the only the only perhaps uh, addition is is as the director said, the crowd control and and between our traffic control officers out there and our sworn officers. They're very familiar and very adept at, at, at making sure that passageways remain open so that everyday passengers can get about their business. Uh, some may want to watch the celebrity and wait for the celebrities. Others want to just mm -hmm. go about their business and get to their flight or leave, leave the airport, and we maintain that passage for them. Councilman, resign. Yeah, We've before he speaks, this was my motion, so I'd like to start the conversation from my perspective. Um, I was very upset when that celebrity um, was uh, charged and brought over to uh, the police station. I frankly felt uh, that he was abused and he reacted. You take a long flight, you get off the plane, and then you're attacked like, like vultures, like flies. Mm -hmm. And the guy had enough. And I don't blame him. Uh, I would have hit the guy too. Uh, that's how angry I get at the uh, intrusion on the privacy of, of people coming through that airport. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was why I put that motion forward, and that's mm -hmm. why uh, Mr. Zine is here, and he seconded that motion, and, and he's mm -hmm. going to come up. Why don't you sit up uh, where Tommy would sit? Uh, and it goes like this. If a celebrity is getting off of that plane, and you know that it's a big-time celebrity, do we automatically prepare a little bit of space to move them through, especially when they go to baggage and things like that? Or what, what rights does that person have versus the First Amendment rights of a photographer? Well, here's what we would do if we knew that um, a celebrity of um, you know, national or international stature was coming through the airport. We would, have, we would, we would place uniformed personnel in the vicinity, uh, particularly if there was a crowd, and anticipate any intrusion upon that person's personal space. But we have to play it by ear because we don't have the right to force people in a public place to move absent some type of public safety situation. And so that's how we would handle it. In this particular case, we, we didn't have any pre-notice that the person was coming through. And, you know, there was an incident. Is there ever any coordination with, like, the Creative Artists Association or, or other groups if they have somebody coming in that then you step to the plate and set up maybe a, a rope where, where paparazzis and fans can be behind? Is there any of that type of request ever made from any of these uh, celebrity, uh, you know, organizations? From time to time, um, there are organizations that will call us in, in the case of uh, Mr. Beckham. Beckham. Mm -hmm. uh, to let us know, and we knew that there would be hundreds of people there, mm -hmm. and we set up uh, barriers and barricades so that they could move through mm -hmm. without. Is there a their protocol their that there. somebody could have that that uh, if you're in the talent business that says if you have somebody coming through and and if you make this call, we can do this or that. They would know. Is there some awareness that either a celebrity themselves, some of them have personal staff, obviously, or they're part of an agency could have that kind of uh, appreciation in the protocol? I have no doubt that um, every celebrity of the stature that they would have personal security is aware that the airport police will work with them <laughs> to ensure the safety of someone passes through the airport. Uh, that being said, we very seldom become aware that celebrities are coming through. We see them visually 
because we are the airport police and traffic people because we're at the airport, you know, 24 seven or, or during all hours of operation. Right. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the vast majority of these folks pass through anonymously. Yeah. And, and if they like want to be if, that way, obviously. And we yeah. love it that way. What, what about charges? Would there be any additional cost to an agency or a celebrity or their staff if, if they needed or asked you to support them in this process? Well, you know, public safety and crowd control is one of our missions. So we don't charge for that because it's not your fault if you're well known and, and, and fans are going to come to see you. Right. But we don't want to be used. Uh, because you want publicity, and unfortunately, sometimes that happens. Okay. The last thing is, say I'm a celebrity going away, you going are through the airport, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm standing in a line. Yeah. Uh, and do you give them special treatment and move them through the line because they might congest the line? There might be people around them. If you see them coming, or do they maybe ask you for that special opportunity to move them through? Or h how about an entry into the airport? Actually, so, actually, that doesn't happen. Uh, the vast majority of them come dressed very casually, mm -hmm. and um, maybe they're recognized by someone in line, but it very seldom becomes an incident where you get a crowd that gathers. Mm -hmm. uh, many times, it, the celebrity will actually contact the airline in advance, and the airline will have a room aside for them, and so they will actually move until their flight is ready, and then they'll move them out and through the screening without any, any, any hindrance. So. Um, that's happened uh, once with Madonna when she came through, and it was very her baggage was all preloaded and and uh, and screened, and so uh, there was really never a problem with her. And in actuality, the airlines do, for high-profile passengers, extend courtesies beyond uh, mm -hmm. uh, what they normally do. Hey, thank you. Uh, we're going to have Dennis uh, present, but would you like to ask any questions? No, I just appreciate what you do and balancing out having represent part of Hollywood, understanding the dynamics. Sometimes people do tip. And say so and so is going to a restaurant, so and so is coming through LAX, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and you do the best you can. And I think it's uh, uh, the situation. I just remember uh, one of the greatest pictures in uh, history is when the Beatles came to New York, and you had Pan Am right there, and that image. And that's what I thought uh, we could never do again, nor should we do again in that on the field type of press conference. But that's how things have changed. You're doing a good job, Chief, and all your officers out there. And, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but I think Mr. Design could contribute from his expertise. Yes. And tell us about the, yeah, you're going to tell us about the paparazzi task force right, and right. How, how all the agencies are kind of working yeah. together. Just a, a couple of points to begin with. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl and I did this jointly and it was seconded by Eric Garcetti. So we were on the same boat when this motion was introduced at the urging of my colleague who represents the airport. Also, uh, when I was in the elevator coming up here, Someone asked me if I was a council member. I said, I'm council member LaBonge. They got their camera out and won my autograph and a picture. So there is some notoriety at council member LaBonge. They were here for the elephant story, but you know, I told them I was LaBonge and it worked. Um, you could say anything you want true. about me. That's say anything true. you want about me, Dennis, as long as I love you tomorrow. I love you too. Uh, we've been working for the past several months uh, with this paparazzi task force with the Sheriff's Department, Beverly Hills Police Department. We've had two meetings. So we've got Pepperdine Law School involved. Screen Actors Guild supports it. So what we're looking at is not that people can't take a photograph, but we're looking at a safety area. Uh, and we're focusing now on an ordinance regarding schools, hospitals, um, other facilities where the celebrities may encounter the paparazzi. The situation that occurred at the airport, similar to what happened in Malibu, similar to what happens in other areas. What we can't prevent is people taking a photograph. What we can prevent is the situation that escalates to violence. As what happened at the airport, there was violence. What happened in Malibu, there was violence. And the news now, where you have hard news, plus you got entertainment news, and you've got people with cameras, whether it be a, a phone with a camera, or a person who wants to capture that million dollar photo, they're right. creating more and more problems because more and more are coming around. When it used to be one or two, it was no big issue. As far as the credentials, credential media seem to have a different decorum, a different respectability. But our motion calls for this establishment of basically what we call a 20-foot parameter around the individual, which has been upheld by the United States Supreme Court on abortion cases where they can uh, protest. So what we're looking at is to introduce that, and that motion went in yesterday. But as far as the airport, I know personally that when you contact the airport dignitary protection, they will provide security on an as-needed basis. If a celebrity believes that they're going to be swarmed, the air police, airport police is very effective in that. I know that recently I took a flight on a Southwest airline, and there was a man who got on the airplane, 
and he had a clock around his neck, a, 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 a chain plus a clock, a big clock, and everyone's looking at this individual, and I don't know who this individual is, but there's an individual by the name of Flavor Flay. <laughs> and Flavor Flay gets on this airplane, and everybody's all impressed with Flavor Flay. I had no idea who this was. I asked the people, who is this guy, Flavor Flay? What's Flavor Flay? Well, I didn't see it until recently, but Flavor Flay is a, is a celebrity. He wears his clock around his neck, and he goes around. He seeks that. You know, some people like this type of swarming by the public, but what we're looking at is to keep people safe. And the whole issue is take your photograph, but don't interfere with people's rights, privileges, and freedoms. So the motion that we've got, it could be enforced at the airport, but if the airport folks think they don't need it, our message would be if you're a celebrity and you think you're going to have an encounter that's going to be negative, contact the airport police. They're there 24 hours a day. They've got dignitary protection, and they will assist you in either your arrival or departure, but they can screen you through uh, the line, you don't have to stand in line. They have different mechanisms to assist the celebrities. So some celebrities want the publicity, some don't, but I think the avenue is there with the cooperation of the airport police that we don't have to do anything special or anything separate, but what we're doing is going to be the general environment of schools, hospitals, other type of facilities where take your picture, but don't interfere with these individuals. And I think if we can come up with that and the city attorney can write that ordinance, we'll be satisfied with it. Uh, and if the celebrities want additional assistance, we're working with the Screen Actors Guild, they're very pleased with what we're moving forward with. But I understand uh, Councilman Rosendahl's concern about a celebrity at the airport who encounters some overly aggressive paparazzi, and there are all those overly aggressive paparazzi. Again, they're not credentialed media. They're seekers to get a photograph for whatever purpose of entertainment or for personal use. So we are not going to be opposed to what the airport police is asking. They're the experts in this area, and I know uh, your, your executive man, you used to be the chief, now you're higher than the chief because the chief next to you. <laughs> but, but I know uh, executive director. but director. director, 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 director butts for many, many years, uh, and I trust his judgment and his direction right. on this, so that's what I would right. recommend. So basically, um, you, the airport police are still involved in this paparazzi task force? We are. Okay, so yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what, how we want to move forward is just continuing to be at the table. Uh, I just listening to you though today uh, again you're talking 55 million passengers maybe only a couple incidents where where this was really a problem um, I think the message is yeah we we do love our celebrities and they're certainly treasures of LA but as as chair of uh, this tourism committee uh, I think you know every passenger that comes through there is a treasure and I really believe our airport police are there to provide public safety to all the traveling passengers. We want this airport to be safe Absolutely. for everyone, but certainly if uh, you feel like there's, and, and I trust your judgment to know if there was an incident that you felt that you needed to have extra personnel, uh, but I'm not sure that I'm willing at this point to move in a direction where anybody that calls and considers himself a celebrity gets extra personnel. Exactly. Um, I, I think your main job is protecting passengers, not necessarily protecting celebrities. Um, and I think if celebrities, you know, do worry about themselves, I think many of them are, can hire their own security and their own bodyguards if that seems to be a problem for them. And, uh, but I, I think your goal is equally protecting all passengers that come in and out of LAX. That, would be my message. Yeah, and, and but Mr. Zine, you mentioned dignitary protection. Is it available to Yes. So if someone has an issue or concern, they can mm -hmm. contact they airport can police. Con they have a dignitary protection detail, and they will screen and find out if it's necessary or not. But, so but there's, we, all, there's so, only so that. You're understand. speaking for them. I yeah. want the uh, so we director. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, their, their primary function is to work with um, uh, visiting, dignitaries. visiting dignitaries, people that have uh, bona fide yeah. security forces, right. and they coordinate things with the Secret Service for presidential right. arrivals. State and so while they could be a contact point, the reality is, is that any area where we'd expect there to be a crowd control issue would be referred to the watch commander and we would deploy uniformed personnel right. to be available in the event there was a public safety issue. And so the, the focus is not on that individual, but actually on the totality of our passengers that travel through the airport so that we can continue to conduct our business 
and have our pastors. Because how many uh, how many do we have on the dignitary detail? There's only six. That right. Can sign. Exactly. But the thing is, they have if so there's a necess necessity, they screen it. Right. They're the experts, right. and they can decide the what needs to be done. That, Sergeant. Right. That's what he just said. I know. I don't. Mr. LeBong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, thing, one thing I would like Bill, if I want to just ask this question here too. Is there a uh, what is happening airport wise on uh, the uh, first class lounges or whatever they have now? Are they getting rid of them or are they adding to them? Is there a vehicle that you because you mentioned uh, Madonna uh, went into a, a lounge? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, most most of the um, terminals do have a first class lounge, right? And I would imagine that any reconstruction. Uh, for the lessee would include those amenities. Correct. So they could make Actually, it. we're improving our VIP lounges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, okay. But again, paparazzi can't get, unless they have a ticket. They can't correct. get they cannot, I got it. They cannot get That's past correct. that area. Thank you. Thank you, Director right. Chief. Yeah, one yes. thing I would like to make sure, though, that we have is a written protocol that if um, I'm creative art agency or, or a particular celebrity with my own security detail, a number to call that tells me what I can do or not do or what I might have to do. Because not everybody knows it. Some have come to me and said, if we only knew we could call a number or there was a procedure we could follow or something. Is there any SOP you can put together, well, standard what, operating what procedure? What we could do, we could look at our website. Uh, for LAX, yeah. and in the section for on airport police, we could put a paragraph or a few lines on what to do if you felt that you were going to have an issue with crowd control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like that. And I think that would be a proactive uh, position for us. And, uh, you know, be it the William Morris Agency or another agency might even have that clarity in their mind when they have some international celebrity coming in that they just want to make sure they've touched base with you. And right. we're working with the Screen Actors Guild. We can also include that. The Screen Actors Guild can utilize that information because mm -hmm. we're That'd be great. dealing right. with them on a daily basis. So right. I think that's a good idea. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank that you. way everybody's happy. Right. Okay. Um, I think we're going to uh, receive and file this motion with the understanding the airport police will continue to participate in the regional paparazzi task force. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Let's um, do item four quickly. Uh, <clears throat> under item four is continued consideration of motion Han Labange introduced on July 29th which proposes that the council ask Lawa to make a presentation on the development and implementation of a new concessions program for LAX and to make periodic progress reports to this committee. On August 6th, Lawa's executive director and staff reported on the proposed new concessions program for LAX and agreed to return in 60 days with a status report. And here they are. Okay. <coughs> We have 15 minutes. Let's go through this as quickly as possible, but let's get to the meat of what this is all about. Okay. Um, Debbie Bowers, Deputy Executive Director of Commercial Development, and with me is Amy Shaw, Deputy Executive Director for uh, Concessions. Mm -hmm. And just to reca recap quickly, the last time we were here, we told you that we were going to put up put steps together that allowed for the whole process to be transparent and inclusive. And in doing that, we've had three community outreach meetings that have totaled over 500 attendee, attendees of the industry and stakeholders. We just, we have given you a handout and we just wanted to, and I won't go through Can you just them. tell me who the stakeholders would be? Um, uh, local community businesses, national companies, uh, companies who are interested in learning how to do business with LAWA. Okay. And in, to continue that process, we have posted the draft RFPs, mm -hmm. one food and beverage, one retail, on our mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. and we are giving those same stakeholders in the community 30 days to give us comments back. And we'll take all those comments in consideration and looking at the uh, RFPs and seeing if we need to make any changes to them. And also, just so that you know, on 12-1, we'll be presenting those, R those packages to the board and, of course, taking their feedback. Uh, getting their feedback and deciding if we need to make any other changes before we ask for the release of the RFPs on the 15th. What do you see as the overall goal for this concessions program? I would, <laughs> going to our goal, well, we have three Is major it to raise goals. revenue? Is it to maximize passengers' experience? Is it to get more local businesses involved? What's, what's your main goal and how you structured this? I would say it's all of the above. And what we did uh, on page two of the handout, we have uh, recapped the goals again for the concession program that we have um, 
gotten from several board meetings, council meetings, um, and we had presented this before, and we think that we've gotten buy-in not only from the elected officials, but from the industry. Um, they have been presented at each community outreach meeting. They all seem what to What elected agree. officials have you gotten buy-in from? Um, did, just presenting it to the council members, listening to what you say. So we tried to take anything that was on record and, and put it together. And we came up with these goals based on what we heard in the transcripts and the discussions that ever were. Okay. Um, well, you know, we were, uh, Councilman Rosendahl and I were there. We missed you, Tommy, on Monday when we unveiled the wow factor, uh, <laughs> the LAX uh, modernization plan. It's pretty exciting. Uh, but we know that um, it's not, it's going to be a few years before we see real results in modernizing that airport. Uh, we we're only going to have two new gates by 2012 and the expected midfield concourse, maybe not until 2013. Uh, but we know that even, even in tough economic times, we know that travelers want updated facilities now. We hear that all the time. It's a dilapidated uh, airport. It's nothing gets com like other international airports or even domestic airports in, in this country. Um, and we know that people want better facilities. Um, so we all think that uh, even though the airport needs an extreme makeover, that maybe a little bit of lipstick and blush will help the experience. Um, and that's why I, d I do think it's important that we, we focus on this um, plan now, even though we're in tough financial ta times. But when I looked at it, um, here are some of the things that struck me that, that maybe um, you can take a look at and maybe go back to the drawing board on. Um, I, I was confused or didn't understand why, for instance, um, for the food packages, um, a bidder could win several. But on the retail side, um, a bidder could only win one of the packages. Uh, no, a proposer no. Can, can propose on, and, and that's on page six of the presentation for the retail packages, okay. there are there are six packages and... A but it says it can be awarded only one mixed one, major package. Right. So what we've done is we've, we've created three large packages, one specialty package. Now the mixed major packages have new stand specialty retail included in them. The one specialty retail that we broke, well, the two specialty retail pro, um, packages that we broke out were in response to community res uh, comment that they wanted smaller packages where smaller companies could propose directly on them. But the larger companies can also propose on them. But they can't be awarded more than one. But they can't be awarded more than so one. So couldn't, wouldn't you set up a situation where you had a, um, a winning bidder, uh, a much superior proposal, and you would be forced to award it to an inferior bidder based on this kind of packaging. Uh, your rule. It seems to me, you know, I, I see, I can see, and then for the third one, if the second one then could only get one, then then the third the third package award could be going to a really inferior bidder. Um, because you're not allowed to give number one or number two another one. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. And, so there, and I, I need a I need a good reason why you're limiting the awarding of these packages. In the industry, in the in the uh, concession industry nationwide, there are at least five really good newsstand and and uh, retail specialty retail operators. Um, before we put the packages together, we actually did a survey of the top 20 airports. And out of all of the airports, there were none of the top 20 that used master concessionaires, which is where you give one company all of the news or all of the, all of the um, food and beverage. About 50% of the airports are doing what we're doing, which is mixing a prime and, and independent. So we have multiple primes and multiple independents. The trend in the industry in going to that sort of model is it increases competition, 
keeps the program looking fresh when there is competition other than one company operating in a, in a terminal or an entire airport? Well, I'm not saying they have to operate, but it seems to me you've, you've, you're limiting yourself in terms of being able to award if they really are the better bidder. Well, we want our goal is to get the highest qualified and the best proposers in each of these categories, and there are. A but by the third time, you're now, you're not getting the, the best necessarily. Well, you're getting the person that hasn't won yet. Depending on the categories, like I said, for the retail, there are several major national companies that operate in airports that are all excellent. So it's not like there's only one or two nationwide that are good and then we'd end up with one really inferior package. Well, but if you left it open, then you would, you would choose based on who is the mo most superior. So if one of the other ones is superior in a certain package, then they would win it. But, but the it fact that you're limiting, you know, only, you're not doing it in the food area. We are doing that in the food area also. Oh, I thought the food area you could win no, more. There are more packages because one of the goals of this program, right now we're heavy with retail short on food. So we are right sizing the program by increasing the number of restaurants. Um, so the food is also, you pr can propose, but may only be awarded one package. You may be awarded, no, you can be awarded more than one package in, in food and beverage. That's what I just asked. I'm sorry. On page five, the, the, the it says proposers may propose on all packages but may only be awarded one package from, from each, each section. From each section. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. In the food, you're allowing the bidders to win more than one. Right. But the retail, you're only allowing them to win one. Because there's more packages, correct. Because right. there are more food and beverage Yeah, packages. I think that's the part I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with. I, I think you're limiting yourselves to... Who can, who can provide the best proposal at LAX. And again, we're trying to get the biggest bang for our buck, and I'm all for opening it up, but I, I just think you're starting off limiting yourself. And I, I would like to see you go relook at that. Okay, and that is a good point, and it has been raised by even some of the executive staff, so we are looking at that again. Right. But what I w would point out to you is that the reason it was in there like that is that one of our goals um, was to encourage local opportunities. One of our goals was to make sure that we had competition, which we think would give us better pricing or, or better revenue because they're competing against one, one another, so it'll increase sales. And secondly, we wanted to make sure that... Um, but they're not really competing against each other. You, you've got people who would only be competing for one because they know they can't win more than one. So they're going to put all their emphasis on winning one but when you look at the way we have it set up, they may win one packages and they're in the five terminals. So there may be one vendor or one mm -hmm. concessionaire who, ha who has a presence in all five terminals, but there will be also other concessionaires in those terminals forcing competition. And the competition will give us more revenue and the competition will also make the customer, they will have to deal with the customers better. They'll have to make sure that customers don't have to wait in line, that they have a good um, inventory of products for them. So we're hoping with the competitive process that we do both satisfy or increase and improve the passenger experience and maximize our revenues. And lastly, the participation of local brands and... Which I think you can still get. Mm -hmm. I think you can still get that by opening it up. So I, 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 that's just one request I would have as you go back and look at that. We'll do that. Um, and, and not limit yourself at this point. But you can still, I think, get local, you know, local interest in that model like you're doing with the food and beverage. Okay. I, I, think you can, I think you can do both. Okay. Let me just ask, um, the other thing I was, I was concerned about was the revenue generation and the proposed rents. Um, I was told that the current operator of the retail spaces subject to this RFP are paying more in rent to LAWA than the RFP would require. Is that true? That is correct. Um, the current newsstand operator, Hudson, acquired the agreement from W.H. Smith. 
and so they have a very high mag. Mm -hmm. So that was based under an agreement that they assumed from another company. So we're going to get less revenue with this RFP. I don't believe that we're going to get less revenue. What we're doing is we are setting the mag um, so that it's not no, so a company can't come in and buy it, and we are pro uh, providing a set of, of assumptions okay. regarding employment so that when we get the financials, we're doing an apples to apples comparison. The strength of the financial, even though we're setting the mag, is mm -hmm. based on the strength of okay. the company and the brand. So you think this will generate more revenue, exactly. which hopefully, because that's the whole point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me ask one more thing about the, the we be me be participation. Okay. Okay, it seemed like um, we're asking for 11%. Is that accurate? No. Uh, no, the ACDBE goals mm -hmm. for this project have not yet been established by contract services. We said they, they base the goals on the packages, and we just sent the packages down to them. So the goals, what is the goal? The goal, well, they have not yet set the goal. We're going to um, submit the goals. As so the goals system. are nowhere in this in this proposal? Correct. And we're going to, to submit them as a supplement to the draft as soon as we get what them. Is, what is, what do we think our goal will be? I, ha I have no idea because that's established by contract services. Okay. Because I think we have, don't we have like 30% right now? with our contractors? Um, we're actually, I don't know. I can get back with you on the phone. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I don't know where I, we got that information, but that's, mm -hmm. we were told it was like 11% that we were asking, which seemed really low. Yeah. No, that is not correct. Okay. Councilmember Rosendahl. Uh, just to, for the record, a bunch of questions. So a lot of people come to me in different ways, and I just want to hear clarity on it. Ms. Hahn pretty well covered it, but I'd like to hear it one more time. Um, can you tell me what percentage financials constitute in the overall score for each bidder and why you select this percentage? Well, the, we had preliminary percentages early on, um, and we've taken those off now because we're reconsidering them. In the original uh, proposal or in the original presentation that we made, um, although there was a set percentage for financial, there's also a financial component in the other criteria, such as strength of concept mm -hmm. and the brands, customer service, the ability to, to um, service the passengers and be open for late night flights. So there are a number of components, even though there is one financial big category, financial is also a consideration in the other categories. So we do not have current percentages. Right. And financial. can you explain how and at what point in the RFP process you will determine that prospective bidders have the financial ability to follow through on their contracts? Uh, in their submission of their financial information with the proposal. And that will be clear enough then for you to, to make that decision. Yes. What is the reasoning behind breaking up the various contracts, and how do you answer those who suggest that brands with exclusivity agreements, such as a Starbucks or a Pinkberry, could be excluded from several terminals? The, the franchisors or the, the um, concessionaires who have license agreements to operate the uh, Pinkberry and Starbucks specifically are among the um, the largest concessionaires who participate at airports, and they and they're very strong companies. So there's no reason to believe that they would not be awarded one of the packages. Okay. Can you explain specifically how breaking up the news and gifts contract will result in better product for customers and higher revenue for the airport? Um, yes, that was based on a study that we did in the industry of the top 20 airports. And airports that used prime concessionaires, either, either for newsstands or for food and beverage, have broken the, the uh, packages, broken down the packages, or they've um, issued RFPs for multiple packages, which has increased revenue, increased customer service. Um, many of the newsstands are designed so that there is a store within a store. So there's a specialty component within that. And that increases those type of offerings when you have multiple operators. Can you respond to those who say that the higher number of contracts available will actually result in less competitive bids from the big concessions operators? That they will result in less competitive yeah, bids? Yeah, how do you respond to those who say that the higher number of contracts available 
will actually result in less competitive bids from the big concession operators? Um, well, I can tell you, for example, uh, I, was a, I, I was a member of the selection committee in San Diego, and they, they pretty much did what we did. They, they um, separated packages and said that you cannot win more than one in each category. In their case, they only had two newsstands and two food. And every, uh, every concessionaire really came in with very, very competitive bids or proposals. Two quick ones to go. Uh -huh. Why are we not requiring drawings and renderings of proposed store space design as part of the RFP packet? Because color boards, uh, dog and pony kind of shows that uh, airports used to require concessionaires to submit a time of proposal are very, very expensive. And they come up with what they think they, that, that the airport wants, but they generally have to go back and redo everything because they don't have the tenant criteria. They're going by the words of the RFP and what the airport wants. So visually, they create their own identity, and I don't know of a case where a tenant has not had to go back and redo their drawings, and it's just unnecessary money, and we, we want to create a, pl a level playing field so that small and mid-sized companies can also participate. And the last question is, are we issuing a separate contract for coffee services? Uh, we did break that package out, and that, from, from th that uh, was broken out as a result of comments that we received at the outreach meeting. Okay. Well, thank you. So there were some changes made as of So uh, back to the coffee, because that's really what it's all about in the morning. I know, right. that's for sure. Um, <laughs> so coffee, because I had also heard someone say that coffee could only be given to one operator. Well, there are coffee, pa there is coffee in. And right now, the lines are right. unbelievably long for that coffee in the morning. There are coffee packages in the mixed majors. And then there's also just a separate coffee package um, that each mixed major can propose on. So we did include coffee in one of the three large packages and then broke out the coffee. And that was really based on comments that we got and requests that we got at the outreach meetings from the public. Let me, let me yeah, if I could just yeah. indulge. Yeah. I, I know it's not official. The three holes you went before, the, explain that real quickly. <laughs> I can't tell you how much my Westchester people have been screaming for this. Yeah, the RFP was approved on um, Monday. Monday at the board meeting. Monday at the board meeting. We're hoping within the next two weeks to finish up the uh, paperwork and have it posted. The bids are due February 2nd, and then we will expedite trying to uh, award and then I am negotiating the contract and I will make sure it's done quickly. And thank you for the call I made to whomever mm -hmm. and whatever happened on that. Thank you, everybody. Let them all know I'm very You're grateful. Welcome. The play now before February for a low score. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good news. Let me just ask, um, one of the things, of course, everybody else is talking about is our financial situation right now. Okay, we've got, uh, you know, everything's in turmoil, in crisis, particularly with borrowing, lines of credit. Well, what makes us think that this is the proper time to do this, especially with the way you have it um, organized, uh, that you're actually going after the independent and the smaller company? What makes us think that they're going to be able to get um, the capital uh, lines of credit, loans that they're going to need to really um, invest in the kind of stores that we're looking for at LAX. That was actually um, a topic that we thought would be covered or, or brought up to our attention at the outreach meetings, and it was never an issue. No one ever brought that up when we talked about the financial. Okay, well, I'm going to bring it up now if they didn't bring it up. And I f still feel like we need to do an analysis before we go out with this RFP. I don't really want to delay it, but at some point, someone needs to take a good look at who your target you're targeting and see whether or not they are going to be able to access um, the credit that they're going to need to start up a, a new business uh, in LAX. Um, I don't know why they didn't bring it up, but I'm bringing it up. Okay, well, well we did. Oh. And if I'm a stakeholder, I'm bringing it up. Sure. We did talk about the um, cost of build out because the cost of build out we're asking is quite high. Um, because we want quality and we want everything redone. And we thought that that would spur comments. Uh, when was your last outreach meeting? Uh, it was 
Early October. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. early October. We are sensitive to what you're saying. Yeah. In fact, I've had we've had conversations with Steve Martin to look at possible ways of being able to help the financing on that. We haven't come up with anything yet, but we right. are sensitive to it and we're looking into it more. Right. I, I would like to see at least some kind of analysis okay. uh, on, on this issue. Um, I'll second that. Okay. I, I just think this is kind of scary, particularly the way you have this structured. <coughs> okay. My recommendations is, you know, uh, I'd like to see a little bit more economic analysis. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is important that we do move right. forward with this, though, because I, I think it's also important. I'm concerned with the way this is structured. Yeah. I, I'm just, I, I don't, I think we're limiting our, ourselves when we are already deciding that firms can only win one package. I, I think you ought to, I, I think you're tying your hands. So that, that's just my recommendation. I'd like you to look at it again and figure out a way maybe you can structure it a little more maybe like the food and beverage package. Okay. Um, and then, you know, figure out, I mean, we can be smart about how we can still get local firms involved uh, in, you know, these packages. Well, we want to remind you, too, this is only okay. terminals 2, 4, 5, 7, 8. We right. still have 1, that. 3, and 6 coming. I know. Which possibly, it looks like we're leaning toward a different type of model. We're I mean, if 50% of the airports you say are doing it this way, that means 50% of them are doing it the other way. Well, no, there are oh. a lot of airports that are doing independent. Like Denver went out with all, with a hundred separate RFPs for the locations. And could, and could firms win more than one? Yes, but they ended up with a huge mixture just because but of the. But they hundred. didn't limit themselves. And I love Denver. You just said the magic word for me. Denver is one of my favorite airports, particularly the food. The st I shop there every time I go. Great. Uh, so you just said the magic word. And, like you said, they opened it up, but they ended up with a, with a great mix. To me, that's more of a competition. And then you end up being able to pick the best, not just awarding it because, you know, the best already got one. Then you're going to have to go to the next best. And then the third time, you're going to have to go to the second next best. And, I, you know, I just think you're limiting yourself. So that would be my... Okay. I'll second that. Thank and, you. you. Know, my questions that I put on the record, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to give you a copy of them. And, and okay. if you could just within the context of a report back, answer them specifically. It'll give okay. more clarity if right. people are confused. Right. Okay, so our recommendation is um, that you take another look at how we're restricting proposals on the major packages. And um, I'd like to see more competition at the outset, especially, especially on the major retail. So that's my feeling. We do, before we take um, a, an official vote on this, Council Member Rosendahl, let's hear from uh, William Smart and Ben Resnick. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm William Smart. I'm the Director of Hospitality at the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Lane has worked for many years to raise standards for airport workers, beginning with the living wage and worker retention ordinances, and has been engaged throughout this long process in ensuring that the RFPs work for Lauer, work for companies, and work for the workers. We want to f first credit the airport and the existing companies for their good work over many years. Workers at LAX make decent wages and have affordable family health care. We value their, stand, their standard highly and know that it is due both to the hard work of our workers to demand it, but also to the commitment and willingness of the leadership at the airport and the leadership of the companies operating at the airport to value working conditions highly. In addition, throughout the development of the RFP, the leadership of LAWA has reached out to us and others to ensure workers' interests are protected. We also believe that the process has improved with the new direction proposed by the current leadership to focus first on some terminals while delaying others. This avoids the mayhem that can result from massive turnover and allows the airport to make good decisions in a timely manner. With all that said, we do feel that at least one key area for improvement is left. In the current proposal, Lauer intends to limit the number of pass packages that can be won by an ind individual company. Their goal in doing this is to encourage competition by having two companies work side by side within terminals. The problem, however, is that it takes away from the airport's highest point of competition, the bidding process. If companies are limited in the number of packages they can win, they will limit their bids 
That is, they will bid on fewer packages, and their bids for those packages may offer less attractive terms, since the competition will be split up rather than heated. We believe strongly that this is a mistake. At the end of the day, Lauer can choose companies to serve a range of purposes for revenue and concepts to serve, quality, to serve job quality. We believe that Lauer needs to give itself a much short, as much choice as possible and therefore should not limit the bidders up front. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So that's a major voice from labor uh, basically not liking this. So that, w that would be a huge stakeholder, in my opinion, that have concerns with this. Okay. Ben. Uh, good morning. Uh, ben Resnick. I know time is late, so I will just make a couple of brief comments. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, first, on the record, I, I do represent Hudson News, uh, so I want everyone to know that. Um, I, I want to say that at the last outreach meeting, and by the way, I think uh, the Lawa staff has done a terrific job in in the outreach, in putting out information, in putting uh, together uh, packages, but we believe there are some major flaws, some of which have been raised today, in the structure, and we think since this is the time to correct it, we should, it should be done. The last outreach meeting was in September, not uh, October. October was the board uh, uh, update. September, a lot has happened since September. Lehman went under, the stock market crashed, we're in a, in a recession, not only in the United States, but in Europe and Asia. Um, and the auto industry is about to tank. Uh, a lot has happened. Today you heard that lower uh, uh, employments or passenger travel is going to be down to 55 million. That's 7 million down. Yeah. And, you, and that's happening across the country. So our point simply is that the RFP needs to recognize some of the realities that we're confronted with for the next few years. Let's, uh, so what are they? In a declining economy, you do want the option at the end of your bidding process for the best operator. Why? Because there's no room for error. If you take operators who are not the best, uh, the fact is the only way Lawa can realize the revenues they want to realize is by higher sales. If passenger travel is down, if the operator is not uh, an operator who's large enough to buy on discount, who's, who can manage and, and, and promote and drive sales, that operator is going to lose sales. And yes, he will pay the minimum guarantee, which everyone has to pay. But the minimum guarantee in this RFP is two and a half million dollars less than Hudson is paying today for these same terminals and pretty much the same locations. So one does need to wonder. I'm not here arguing for a higher mag. I'm not here to argue that we, everyone should pay more rent. I'm just <laughs> suggesting that there is something in this economic time that needs to be looked at and uh, evaluated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I think we've we've raised. A, a, a lot of concerns about this and again we're you know it's right. tough times and it's unfortunate I, I feel that way in you know on my waterfront development yeah. on uh, and everything that we're doing we're, uh, the housing that we're building I feel terrible that this has hit us so hard but I think we need to be realist about this and look at, at this in terms of the financial uh, market out there and 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 let's not tie our hands is all I'm saying I think you're gonna get the end result that you want by opening it up a little bit on the front end that that's my opinion and I think and we, we both we back both back asked for that and, okay. and we strongly would like you to come back so yeah back. so come back to us you know with with this new input and and, and and see if we can get something which I think might be better. Okay. 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 Second that. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Rosendahl. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Run down to.